بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد رضي الله عنهم وردوا عنه وقال تعالى ومنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا I'm actually very I was actually looking forward to this particular talk because Saeed ibn Zayd is one of the ashara mubashara one of the ten that have been given the glad tidings of paradise but he's probably the least well known among them. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, of course, Zubayr ibn al Awam, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, they, they seem to be much more well known than Sa'id ibn Zayd. Radiallahu an. And the reason for that you will see, inshaAllah. His story starts earlier. Let's look at the time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had not been, had not yet received prophecy. They were, this was still the time of Jahiliyyah. And what happened at that time is that there was a special festival taking place where all of these people from Mecca and other areas maybe were coming with all of their fineries. It was one of their days of celebration, all well dressed up. And they were coming towards where the Haram, the Kaaba is or was. And they were bringing different animals there to sacrifice for the various different idols that they used to believe to be God. There was one man sitting there. There was one man sitting there who probably bore it for a while, who looked at all of this and he looked at it for a while, but then eventually he couldn't take it any longer and he said that the heavens from which the water comes to supply the crops and the animals, the one who gives it the shape and the nourishment is Allah and you're sacrificing these very animals for these other idols who do nothing. He couldn't help it when he saw these people doing what they did. Who was this person? This person was the father of Sa'id radiallahu an, Zayd. Among the, among the Arabs at, uh, in Mecca, etc., who uh, among, among them who had given up their religion, their local religion, their local belief in these idols and so on, there were about four or five. Two of them eventually became Christian. Tanassara, that, that one of them was Waraka ibn Nawfal as we know. Uh, another two, they, it seems like we don't know what exactly they became, they definitely given up the idol worship and whether they took on a religion or not, we don't know about that. But when it comes to Zayd, he had wanted to go and look for the religion of Ibrahim salam. And eventually, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a short while, but then eventually he was told by somebody that the religion that you're looking for, the Hanifi religion, the Hanifi religion, which is basically the religion of pure monotheism, pure oneness, that's of Ibrahim, that's, that's, uh, the, it's no more anymore. Right? But then uh, he died before the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet. He died beforehand. So let's go back to talking about Saeed, who is his son now. He's obviously being brought up in a house that talks about oneness of Allah all the way through. So it was probably less of a struggle for him in terms of his immediate family, though his uncle who was Khattab, Umar radiallahu anhu's father. Khattab, that was another story. Khattab was one of the leaders of the Quraysh and he was very aggressive against anybody who'd left the faith. In fact, Khattab used to trouble his father, Zayd. Because Zayd he used to say, how long you're going to carry on doing this? He used to tell Zayd, how long you're going to keep now? You're becoming such an irritant, we're going to... And then the, the persecution had begun on his father. So that was Khattab, that was his cousin, that was his, these were cousins of his. So anyway, let's get, get back to Zayd. He was one of the, obviously as we mentioned, he's one of the ten who have been given the glad, uh, glad tidings of paradise. 
He's also one of the earliest people to become Muslim. He was the 13th man to become Muslim. The 13th man to become Muslim. And this was before even they used to, before they were holding the meetings in the Darul Arkham, in the house of Arkham. This was quite early on, you could tell. His lineage, as we always quote, is just to get an idea of where he joins up with the Prophet's lineage is Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. So, ibn Nufayl, Amr and Khattab, they're connected because they're both sons of Nufayl. Ibn Abdul Uzza ibn Riyah ibn Abdullah. Ibn Qurt, Ibn Zira, Ibn Rizah, Ibn Adi, Ibn Ka'b. That's where they link up because Ka'b ibn Luwai, that, that is where it links up with the Prophet. But immediately at that point, he's considered to be a different family. Umar is a different family to the family of Rasulullah because while they're connected up there, but in terms of clans, they've separated now. His sister is somebody we need to speak about. The, the sister of? Of, of uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd. His sister's name was Atika. If that rings any bells. His sister's name was Atika. That's uh, Atika bint Zayd. Obviously, uh, their, their fathers are the same. Sa'id and her, the fathers are the same. Zayd is their father, but the mother is different. Her mother was Umm Qurz bint al Hadrami. She also became Muslim at a very early age, uh, early on, and she gave the bay'ah, she made the migration, and initially she was married to Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu son Abdullah. Later, after he passed away, she married Umar ibn al-Khattab, her cousin. So, let's not get confused here. Umar radiallahu anhu marries her, he is, she is her, his cousin, and Eventually you'll find out that Sa'id ibn Zayd, who we're speaking about, he is married to Umar radiallahu sister, and Umar radiallahu anhu is married to his sister. Right? And Atika, she is, she is well known. I mean, the story is about her radiallahu anha. So now, a bit about the family. This is the interesting part here. Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nawfal. Umar, son of Khattab, son of Nawfal. So Nawfal is the grandfather of Omar. However, Sa'id, son of Zayd, son of Amr, then son of Nawfal. So he's like a nephew in a sense, right, to Omar radiallahu anhu. But what's very interesting here is that his grandfather Amr, son of Nawfal, right, there were two things. This Amr inherited his father. He was probably the older brother, so he inherited from his father, Nawfal. He also inherited his other wives. In the time of Jahiliyyah, you would inherit your father's other wives, who were your stepmothers. That was the tradition of the time. So, this Amr inherited from Nawfal, Khattab didn't. That mother that he inherited, or that woman he inherited, was the mother of Khattab. So Nawfal's son was Khattab. The wife that he had her from was inherited by his other son, Amr, the older son. And from Amr comes Zayd. So Zayd is a nephew of Khattab and also a half-brother, a mother-connected brother. That's interesting. You don't do that anymore, right? So that, that's the connection there. If you didn't get that, it's okay. It's not that important. Just to tell you what they, the, per, the quirky things they used to do in those days, and Islam came and closed all of that. So Saeed ibn Zayd, now we're, that's who we're, we're getting back to Saeed ibn Zayd now. Uh, we're going to speak a bit about his father, but we'll speak about Saeed ibn Zayd. He was obviously born before the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, and this was maybe over 10 years before that. So before 10 or so years before the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, because he died around 50 Hijri, 50 or 51 Hijri, right, during the time of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And when he died, he was about 70-something, which means that he must have been born before 
Islam, right? He was also called Abu al-A'war and or Abu Thawr. These are some other names he's known by. But the description that some of the biographers and historians have given that he was a tall person, quite hairy and slightly dark. His father, let's get some understanding of his father because I think his father definitely had an influence in the fact that he becomes Muslim so early. As I said, his father, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, was a Hanifi, right? A person, unfortunately, he didn't live in law. He met the Prophet Sallallahu but he did not, uh, not in prophecy. He died before the Prophet Sallallahu got his prophecy, so he can't be a Sahabi in that sense. So he was looking for the deen of Khalil, alayhi salam. He would not worship any idols. He would not eat anything. A lot of, there was a lot of free food in those days that they would come and give to these idols. And they would just put there and people would eat. Right? Easy food that was. He would never eat anything like that. Imam Bukhari has related about him from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an that once this same Zayd, the father, went out to Sham. Because when he got tired, he was being persecuted and so on. He went to Sham, uh, to Syria. To look for the deen, to look for this deen of Ibrahim to look for the right deen. And um, eventually he found, according to this tradition, it says that he found one of the rabbis of the Yehud. And he asked them about their, their deen. So he said, tell me about your faith because maybe I will follow it because I'm looking for a different faith. So the person, this rabbi told him, don't follow our faith. Right? Don't follow our faith. Because you may attain a portion of the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may receive a portion of the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Zayd said, well, I've been running away from the anger of Allah. I don't want to carry, I don't want to take on the anger of Allah. So I'm not going to take this faith. How can I, how can I bear the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reign upon me? Can you tell me about anybody else I can go to? So he says, I don't know anybody else who's Hanifi at this point. Because remember, it was a time of great darkness. The faiths of the Christians and Jews had been altered by that time already. There was no proper religion. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was eventually sent. So Zayd said, what is this Hanif you're speaking about? What's a Hanif? So he said, that's the deen of Ibrahim. He was neither Makana Yahudiyan wala Nasraniyan. He was neither uh, Yahudi, neither was he Nasrani. He would only worship Allah, one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then Zayd went looking more in search. Finally, he met a Christian priest. And he mentioned the same thing to him. The person said the same thing that, look, you don't want to take our deen either. Right? Because you may come under the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you know there's a lot of changes or whatever the case was he says I'm running away from the curse of Allah I wouldn't want to take on this religion anyway so how where would you send me so he says I don't know anybody who's on the right religion of uh, the Hanifiyya of this monotheism and oneness and he told him the same thing that Ibrahim was neither this side or neither that side so eventually he, that's what he declared. He said, I'm on the faith of Ibrahim. Salam. That's what he said. And then he said, Oh Allah, bear witness that I am on the faith of Ibrahim. Salam. So that's why this Zayd would go and he would sit by the Kaaba. He would relax by the Kaaba and he would tell, he would announce, make this announcement. He was fearless. Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh. Oh congregation of the Quraysh. Wallahi. Um, there is nobody among you who's on the deen of Ibrahim salam besides me. I'm the only one. Because remember the others, although they'd given up idol worship, they had turned to other things. Nobody was on this particular faith. So then he used to do a few things. He used to really dislike and find very repugnant and ugly that they would bury their daughters alive. So he would go and try to save them. So either he would dig them out or he would tell people, look, if you can't look after them, give them to me. I will look after them. I will bring them up. So when he would do that, and then when they'd get old enough to a certain age, he would go and say, look, do you want your daughter back? If you want your daughter back, you can have, have her. Otherwise, I'm willing to carry on looking after her. That's what he would do. You can tell he was a pure, you know, uh, purely for the sake of khidmah. You know, he was a pure, they would say, Samaritan. I don't know if that, how good that term is, right? He meant, as I said, he, it's related that he met the Prophet before the Bi'tha, before the Prophet received his prophecy. 
and um, he, th there was some food that was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu which was uh, based on the idol, so the Prophet Sallallahu refused to eat it and he also refused to eat it. Right? He said, O people of Quraysh, it is God who has created the sheep. He it is who has sent down rain from the skies of which they drink. He has caused the fodder to grow from the earth with which they feed. And then you still slaughter them in the name of other than him. Indeed, I see that you are very ignorant folk. That's what he would tell them. For, that, for you to do that against your whole community, that's a big deal. It's not an easy thing to do. So now it's related from the Prophet wasallam that he said that he, Zayd, يُبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أُمَّةً وَحْدَهُ he will rise on the day of judgment. You know, all the on the day of judgment, you'll have the various different nations, communities, the different ummas. They will be themselves. He will be alone as an ummah on his own. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said about him. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that when I entered paradise, you know, when he had his ascension, when he had his uh, ascension experience, he said, "Dakhaltul Jannah," and I saw that Amr ibn Nufail had a position. Zayd finally died in Sham because he'd left Makkah. He finally died in Sham and um, there's a group of people who'd killed him down there. And this, the, the time he died was when the Quraysh were finally building the Kaaba. Before the Prophet ﷺ became Prophet, when they were building the Kaaba, that's when, around that time is when he died in Sham in Syria. About five years before the, five years before Nubuwa, five years before. Now let's go back to uh, his son. Sa'id ibn Zayd. So again, as I mentioned, he brings Islam. He enters into Islam at a very early age. He's from the Sabiqeen al awwalin And his wife becomes Muslim at the same time. Who's his wife? The sister of Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu is against Islam. He's actually going and persecuting people. He's uh, in a position of authority. He doesn't know that his sister, Fatima bintul Khattab, who's actually the cousin of Sa'id anyway, Right, Sa'id ibn Zayd, they married, they become Muslim. Their teacher is Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu, who comes and secretly teaches them the Qur'an. They can both read, right? So he comes and teaches them. However, then the famous incident takes place when Umar radiallahu finally says, you know what, I'm just going to go and kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Let's just end this whole problem. Because for so long he's caused problems, let's finish it. He goes out with his sword and on the way he meets Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, who's a Muslim, but he, he's not revealing it. Where are you going with this sword? He said, I'm going to kill this man who's caused so much destruction and caused so much fitna in the community. So he said, why don't you go and sort out your own household first? He was trying to detract him. He says, why don't you go and sort out your own household that your brother-in-law and your sister, they've become Muslim. Do you think that if you kill the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you think the family of the Banu Mana, Banu Abd Manaf, the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you think they're going to leave you? You're going to be in trouble. Rather go and sort your own household out. So this was just his way of detracting him, and obviously this is what was written. So Sa'id ibn Zaid he goes to his house, his sister's house. He goes to his house. For, uh, his uh, that Sa'id ibn Zaid and Fatima bint al Khattab, and that was the time when they were having their class. So he heard something from outside. But as he knocked and he found Umar, they all hid and Khabbab radiallahu anh hid and they hid the script, the scroll or whatever it was written on. And he went inside and he started beating them up. He beat his brother-in-law and uh, his brother-in-law was obviously frightened of him. He, he beat him up and then he struck his sister when she tried to defend. And the story is famous. Eventually he felt sorry for her when she started bleeding and says, show me what you're reading. And then she said, no, you can't touch it. And then they declared, look, we're Muslims. Regardless of what you say, we're Muslim, do what you want. Right now, the thing about Saeed ibn Zayd, because he's from one of the Ashraf, he's from one of the noble tribes of Arabia. He didn't have to hide too much. He wasn't persecuted. He just had to hide from his own family. He wasn't worried about anybody else. He had to hide from his own cousin because Umar and Khattab radiallahu anhu in that time were problematic. But in terms of general persecution, he didn't have to worry because he's from the noble tribes. Okay. So. Finally, he be, uh, Umar Adinu becomes Muslim and we've dealt with that story already. Now going back to Sa'id ibn Zayd, he did not travel to Habasha. 
You know the earliest migration was to Abyssinia because they were being persecuted. I just mentioned that he was not being persecuted. He was quite in a relaxed state, right? Especially after Umar became Muslim, there was nobody to trouble him after that. He didn't have to go to Abyssinia. However, he did, him and his wife, they both traveled to Medina Munawwara. They did the migration to Medina Munawwara and they did it with Umar Now Umar story is famous. Everybody else was secretly leaving because they would be stopped, they would be persecuted, they would be prevented. Umar calmly goes to the Haram first. He does a tawaf. He makes a declaration that I'm leaving. Right? Everybody else would leave without telling anybody in the middle of the night or something. He tells everybody after doing tawaf and he said, which one of you wants to see his wife widowed, his children orphaned and his mother crying over a lost child and follow me beyond this valley. So he went with a group of his family and friends and among them was his brother and his cousin and his sister. So they all traveled together. His brother was Zayd ibn al-Khattab, also became Muslim and uh, I believe Zayd ibn al-Khattab became Muslim before him. So anyway, they all traveled and they, they went there and finally Sa'id ibn Zayd was made a brother with either Ubay ibn Ka'ab or Zayd ibn Rafi ibn Malik al-Zuraqi. Those were Medina and Ansar. And you remember the Prophet would make a brother, brother connections between the Muhajirin and the Ansar. He, with every Sahabi, there's this discussion about how many battles they took part in because that was the major achievement in those days that you took to show your seriousness. You had to defend. Because these, most of these were defensive battles, most in the beginning were mostly defensive battles anyway, to protect them. So he pretty much took part in every single battle. Whether that be Hudaybiyah, even in Hudaybiyah, in uh, Uhud, in Khandaq, he was in all of the battles except Badr. Now why would somebody who's really into it, because he's known to be very ferocious, very full of valor, as you'll see later on when he fights during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar an, why would he miss the battle of Badr? which was such an important one. And those who were in the Battle of Badr, the 313 or 15 or so, they've got a very special position. So how did he miss that? The reason he missed it is because him and two people, both he and uh, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, both of them were sent by the Prophet wasallam to go and find out where this caravan of the Quraysh was. Because they knew that the caravan of the Quraysh was coming down with all of these goods and everything. So he had sent them to go and look out for where they were. So they got there and they found out where they were. But before they could come back, the Prophet ﷺ found out about the caravan anyway. So he prepared to go and fight them already. And these people didn't know that. So when they came into Medina Munawwara, they were returning from that battle. So that's how he missed it. But then they were obviously very upset. Right? They were very upset, so that's why the Prophet ﷺ gave them a portion as well. Because they'd gone for the same purpose, though they didn't fight. But he gave them a portion as well. So he, uh, 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 Saeed ibn Zayd asked, Wa ajri, I want my reward. What about my reward? You know, as being, he says, Wa ajruk, as well. You get the reward as well. So you get a portion of the spoils and you also get the reward as well. Saeed ibn Jubair, Saeed ibn Jubair, another Sahabi, he relates that the position, the placement and the position of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Talha, Zubair, Sa'ad, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Sa'id ibn Zayd, these were Ya'ashar and Mubashara, right? Their position when it came to battle was always in front of the Prophet ﷺ, defense line. They were always closest in the front. When it came to Salat, they were always behind. Right, so in Salat, they were, they, these were very close. I mean, they're not Ashar and Mubashara for no reason. Now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam departs from this world, Sa'id ibn Zayd is still alive. And during the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, which means Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu, initial, the initial period, he took place in, he took part in uh, many of the great battles, especially the Battle of Yarmouk. The Battle of Yarmouk against the Romans was a very important battle. It was a, you, know, you know why that battle was so important? Is because that was a defining battle. And what actually happened in that case is that he himself, it's related about him, he says himself, for the battle of Yarmouk, we were 24,000 or thereabout. 
we were only 24,000. That's a lot compared to Badr and Uhud. But here you're talking about a whole different ball game. We were only about 24,000 or so against us, the Byzantines. These are the Romans. They were mobilized 120,000 men. We are only 20 something thousand. They are a hundred or so more, or about 100,000 more. And they advanced towards us. Remember these Meccans before the, the, the Sahaba, they had generally been dealing with other Arab tribes, which was like primitive warfare, just basically killing one another with swords and spears, and it was basic stuff. The worst battle that they'd fought was Khandaq, where all the tribes had come together. Now they're against this Roman army, right? That is there with all of its splendor. So he describes it. He said, they advanced towards us with a heavy and thunderous movement, as if mountains were being moved. Bishops and priests strode before them, bearing crosses and chanting litanies, which were repeated by the soldiers behind them. Because remember, by that time, the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire initially was, was pagan. But from Constantine's time, Constantine was a Greek emperor of the Roman, and he basically turned it to Christianity. So now the whole Roman, which they call the, Byzant, the, the Byzantine Empire, has now its headquarters in Istanbul. It's moved away from Rome now. All right? And they are Christians now, right? So Heraclius is actually the leader of the Romans at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, not Hercules. Hercules is a mythical Greek god. This is Heraclius, the Roman. Okay? So anyway, they, they, when the Muslims saw them mobilized like this, they became very worried by their vast number. Because a, uh, a lot of war is about shock and awe, isn't it? It's about who shows the greatest military might. Right? That in itself just demoralizes people. So he said, fear entered upon their heart. Now Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah is, the, is the general. Right? Remember, Khalid bin Walid, I think he may have been sent elsewhere at this point, or I'm not sure if he was there. But Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, who's, who's one of the Ashara Mubashar as well, right? he stood, stood before the Muslims and urged them to, to fight. He says, worshippers of Allah, Help Allah and Allah will help you and make your feet firm. Worshippers of Allah, be patient and steadfast for indeed patience and steadfastness, sabr, is a salvation from unbelief, a means of attaining the pleasure of Allah and a defense against ignominy and disgrace. Draw out your spears and protect yourself with your shields. Don't utter anything among yourselves but the remembrance of Allah Most High. Until I give you the command, inshallah, if Allah wills. Thereupon, suddenly a man emerged from the ranks of the Muslims. That's when he gave this impassioned speech. One of the men, he suddenly got up from the ranks and he said, I have resolved to die this very hour. I'm ready to die this very hour. Have you a message to send to the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? May God bless him and grant him peace. Abu Ubaidah then said, yes, convey salam to him from me and from all of the Muslims and say to him, O Messenger of Allah, we have found true what our Lord has promised us. As soon as, now Talha is saying, uh, sorry, Sa'id ibn Zaid is saying, as soon as I heard the man speak and saw him unsheathe his sword and go out to meet the enemy, I threw myself on the ground and I crept on all fours with my spear I then fell the first enemy horseman racing towards me, so they couldn't see me. So I went crouched and I went on the ground and then suddenly I got up because some, there's another description about him that this is exactly what he did, that he, he, he was like, an, he was like a, a lion, right? He was like a lion in this battle. And he says, God removed from my heart all traces of fear when I did this. Fear is a feeling, it's an emotion. And there's ways to remove it and there's ways to increase it. And there's ways to become overwhelmed by it. Some people manage fear better than others. Some people manage suffering better than others. If you can learn to, if we can learn to deal with suffering, if we can, in, any, in our life in general, you just have a better life. And if we're very sensitive and the smallest amount of suffering sets you back, makes you start worried, then that's very difficult. These are just emotions. Right? These are emotions, you can't even see them, they're acted out, as opposed to a wound in the body which is physical. Right? 
So eventually what happened is the Muslims engaged the advancing Byzantines and continued fighting until they were blessed with victory. They, they, they had victory over these 120,000, alhamdulillah. And then eventually he took part in the opening of Damascus. And then when that happened, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, uh, he was then called, uh, he had sent some messages to the people of Elia. Do you know what Elia is? Jerusalem. Jerusalem was called Elia because the actual old city of Jerusalem was constructed later after Umar Allah's time. The main city there was called Elia, which was, I forget the Roman name of it. The Roman name is called Elia. And it was only afterwards that all of this uh, Masjid Laksa and everything was discovered and then made and everything. Because they had a whole separate, you know, because of the Isa alayhi salam and so on. So he, it was just called Elia in those days. Right? That's what it was called, Ilya. Not even Baytul Maqdis, not Jerusalem. You know, I mean, in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala refers to it as that. So that was obviously a historical designation of it. But it was known in, as Ilya in those in, in those days. So he'd written to them that look, you need to either accept Islam, or whatever, because you know they're the, they're the next area. And um, so because they didn't respond, he had to go in that direction, and he left Saeed ibn Zaid over Damascus. So Saeed ibn Zayd was one of the first to be put over Damascus, right, uh, as a deputy uh, uh, under Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. Then during the Khilaf of Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, you have to remember he's Ashara Mubashara. And if you remember what we had discussed about Umar Din when he was about to die, he made that committee of six people which were the, re- the majority of the remaining of the Ashara Mubashara. The only person he left out of that was Saeed ibn Zayd. Right? The only person he left out of that six-person committee, he put in there Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhu, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, and uh, Talha, Zubair, and um, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, and he did not put Saeed ibn Zayd in there. Right? Which is very interesting, even though he's Ashara Mubashri, it could have been seven, but he didn't. And the reason they say that he didn't do it is because he was very just. He did not even want the suspicion that I put him in there because he's my brother-in-law, and he's my cousin as well. He's my family member. Because all the others were not his family members. He was his family member, but he refused to allow him to be part of that group. And then Saeed ibn Zayd himself was a very low-key person, it seems anyway. You'll see, uh, you'll see about that later in terms of the way he... In war, he was up there, but otherwise he was quite a low-key person in that sense. Um, it's... Then after that, you have all of the bad times. Towards the end of Uthman of the Allah's reign, you had Uthman of the Allah's martyred. He took no part in that. Then after that, you have the Jamal and Sifin, the issue of the camel and the Nasifin, Muawiyah and Ali radiallahu anhum. You have that problem. He doesn't take part in any of that. So he was a pacifist. He just did not take part in any of that, just like Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu didn't either. Right? And um, he was given a piece of land in Aqiq. The Wadi of Aqiq is just outside Medina Munawwara. I think there's a, like a nice stream running through it as well. And that's where uh, he was given a land. And that's where he settled. And that's where he lived. That's why in the time of Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu, uh, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhum, they finish. Hassan, radiallahu anhu, becomes Khalifa for like six months. He then hands it over to Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu. And then finally, you've got peace in the Muslim world again. Right? Now, during his time, uh, this is around the 41st Hijri now, right? 41 Hijri or so, right? Because the 40 years have finished after the Prophet ﷺ, the Khilaf al Rashid has finished now. Now um, it's the next stage. So he would, he would stay there, and Marwan ibn al Hakam, who was the governor, who had been the governor of Uthman his time, and one of the Umayyads. From him comes the Umayyad dynasty afterwards. But right now, Muawiyah is the Khalifa in Damascus of the Muslim world. But the governor of Medina Munawwara under Muawiyah, or for Muawiyah was who? Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan al-Hakam is a very interesting person. Sometimes you see him to be extremely righteous, with the right frame of mind, doing the right things. And then sometimes, later on, you see him doing some weird things. And a very strange kind of individual in that sense. So his son is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who then becomes the, the, the Khalif of the entire land much later on, and then his sons, and that's the Umayyads. But anyway, this is well before that time. He's the governor of Medina Munawwara. 
Muawiyah is towards the end of his life. He sends, he sends these messages to Medina Munawwara that has, have everybody uh, give bay'ah, pledge of allegiance to my son Yazid as the next Khalif. He's already done it in Sham, I think. He wants the people of Medina Munawwara to do so as well. Nobody had done it yet. I don't think even Marwan had done it yet. It seems from the sources, Wallahu alam. So, then a messenger came, a delegate, a deleg uh, uh, an ambassador came from Sham to Medina Munawwara and said to Marwan, what is preventing you from giving the bay'ah, from giving the pledge? So he said, I'm waiting for Sa'id ibn Zayd to come, because remember, a lot of the other Sahaba, they'd moved out. All the great Sahaba, they'd moved out. They were in Sham and Iraq and other places. Um, Sa'id ibn Zayd had preferred to stay in Medina Munawwara, but he was on the outskirts. He hadn't come and taken a bayah. Maybe an announcement had, made, had been made, but he hadn't come yet. So when he comes, he is the Sayyid Ahl al Balad. He's the leader of the, the entire city, of the people of the city. He's the greatest person that we have here. Once he does so, everybody else will do so as well. So this Shami, he's a bit zealous, right? He goes and he says, Should I, I, let me go and bring him. Right? So he goes to where he was, where Saeed ibn Zayd, he goes to his house and he says, come on, come and give the bayah. I don't think he understands who he is, right? He just thinks, whoever he is, let me call him so that I can get my job done and go back. So Saeed says, okay, you go and I will soon come and give the bayah. You go. Now this person, I said, the Shami is a bit impatient, right? The Shami is a bit impatient. He said, you better come with me, otherwise I'm going to cut off your throat. I'm going to slice off your head. So he said, you're going to strike off my head. Wallahi, those that you are inviting me towards are the very people that we were fighting against for the sake of Islam. Probably the Shamis he's talking about. Wallahu alam. I'm not sure, right? He's probably talking about Shamis, right? So, because he was part of the conquest of Sham. So then this guy, okay, he got the he got the message and he returned back and he said to Mar uh, and he went and told Marwan. So Marwan said, "Be, be silent, uskut, chupre," right? He didn't say it in Urdu, by the way. Right? He just said, "Be quiet." And then after that, soon after that, one of the wives, Azwaj Mutaharat, passed away. It just coincidentally happened that one of the Azwaj Mutaharat had passed away. And she had actually made a bequest, right, in her will, that Saeed ibn Zayd should pray her Janazah prayer. So the Shami says to Marwan, he doesn't know this. And he's, the Janazah's there, and they're waiting. And the Shami is telling Marwan, why don't you pray on her? What's preventing you from praying on Umm al -Mu'mineen? So he says, wait, I am waiting the one you wanted, I am waiting for the one you wanted to take his head off. I am waiting for him. Because the Umm al-Mu'mineen radiallahu anha has made a bequest that he is the one who pray over her. That's when the Shami finally said, Astaghfirullah. I seek forgiveness. I think that's when it hits home that he's messing with the wrong person. Abu Bakr ibn Muhammad ibn Amr ibn Hazm has said that another story about him because Saeed ibn Zayd was a mustajab al-da'wah. His du'as were all accepted. So once this woman, her name was Arwa bintu Uwais. Arwa bintu Uwais. She came to the governor Abu Muhammad ibn Amr ibn Hazm and she said to him, O oh, Abdul Malik, Saeed ibn Zayd, he's built a dam on my land. He's built a dam on my land. Go and talk to him and sort this matter out so that you can get my right back for me. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the masjid and I'm going to literally scream out and embarrass him. Right? Like I'm going to call for justice in the masjid and I'm going to do it in the masjid. In the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so he said to her that, look, why are you bothering this companion of the Prophet ﷺ? He would never have oppressed you. He would never take your right. He just didn't believe her. So then she went out and she went to these other two, Umara ibn Amr and Abdullah ibn Salama. And she said, can you go to Zayd 
and get my right because he's oppressed me, he's built this dam in, in, my, uh, in my piece of land and um, otherwise I'm going to go to the masjid and humiliate him. Right? So they felt that they should just go and tell him what's going on so they come to him and he said, look we've come to you and because this woman is complaining and um, so he immediately says, How c how's that possible? He says, I have heard the Prophet وسلم, saying Man akhada shibra min al -ard. Anybody who takes even a hand span Saeed ibn Zayd is saying, I've heard this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever takes a piece of land, you're going to be girdled with it seven layers down into the earth. Why would I do such a thing? But you know what? Go to her. As I said, he was a very, very simple person. He says, go to her and tell her she can take whatever she wants. She can take that land back. She can take the land if she wants. If she thinks it's her right, go and take it. He just wanted to avoid the problem. But he said, Oh Allah, if she did, now he made a dua. He said, Oh Allah, if she is a liar, then don't let her die until you take away her eyesight. And then you make her death come because of it, because of her blindness. They came back and they told her exactly what had happened, but she was on a mission, right? She went and she broke down the dam or whatever it is, she built whatever she had to believe, uh, build and then it was very soon afterwards, within a short time, she became blind. She would then, in the middle of the night, she'd have to actually take her servants or whoever they are, the workers, the, 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 the laborers, have to go and wake them up and go and take them to work there. And on one occasion, on one occasion she wasn't woken up by her servant, so she got up herself and she went and she fell into a well and died. That was basically the power of his dua. Finally, Saeed ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu, he passed away in 51 or so Hijri, uh, during the time of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu while he's in Sham. Uh, he dies in Aqiq, obviously outside Medina Munawwara. And he's carried, his janazah is carried to Medina Munawwara and he's obviously prayed, uh, prayed upon there. And the people who went when they heard that he had died to bathe him was Abdullah ibn Umar. It was actually a Jumu'ah. It was a Friday. And it was a morning time. In fact, it says Abdullah ibn Umar missed Jumu'ah because he, he'd gone there, especially out on the outskirts. And there's no Jumu'ah there anyway, right? And the other person was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. They buried him. And um, after Sa'id ibn, uh, Sa ibn Abi Waqqas, he then took a shower, he then took a bath afterwards. And then he made it very clear when he came out, he says, look, I'm not taking a bath because I bathed him, don't think that. It's because it's hot, that's why I'm taking a bath. He just wanted to clarify to everybody. And both of them went, uh, were in the grave uh, to take his, to, uh, to bury him and intern him inside. He had, over the course of his life, very interesting, over the course of his life, he had ten wives. Meaning not, not at once, but over the course of his life, probably maximum four at once, but you know, over the course he went through ten wives. And from that he had about thirty something, something children. Right? MashaAllah. People just don't have that kind of productivity these days. Nor that kind of ability or whatever you want to say. Right? Um, obviously one of his wives was Fatih. I don't want to mention his, all of his wives' names because there's no point of that. But one of his wives was obviously the uh, sister of Umar radiallahu anh, Fatima bint al-Khattab radiallahu Her name was Ummu Jamil. That was the title, Ummu Jamil. She's well known as Ummu Jamil. And uh, uh, they only had one son. One son from, him, from her. He only had one son. All the majority of the others were from the other nine wives. And his, that son's name was Abdul Rahman. Uh, in terms of narrations, as I said, he was a very quiet person. Right? But then Abu Bakr was not, I mean, was a Khalifa, but he still didn't have so many narrations. Uh, Saeed ibn Zayd had comparatively very less narrations that are transmitted from him today, but it's still 48 narrations that you have. Compare that to Abu Huraira, five, right, some over 5,000. Compare that to 43, whereas Abu Huraira actually became Muslim only towards the end. He only had a few years, right? Whereas Saeed ibn Zayd is there right from the beginning, 13th person to become Muslim. Right? So anyway, that's his narration. Some of them are in Bukhari and Muslim. Some of them are just in Bukhari while others are transmitted by Muslim Ahmad and others. But the main thing that we learn, I guess, from these numerous lessons is that they did what they had to do. 
they stayed away from what, they, what, what didn't involve them. But the main thing about them is that these are the Ashara Mubashara. You don't become Ashara Mubashara. You don't become specially selected people at any time. You can't be Ashara Mubashara anymore. But you could be something similar in, these day, in this day and age by doing some kind of outstanding feat that is desired by people by doing, providing a service. These people didn't become Ashara Mubashara for no reason. They were with the Prophet all the time. They were defending the faith. They were doing the right thing. And that's what we need to do today. This is the biggest lesson I get from the Ashara Mubashara. That why were they given a special position? We can't, you know, we've lost that time where we could have been with the Prophet But we can at least get some kind of distinguishment, some kind of distinction of this time by maybe doing something today that is needed. Right, providing a service that is needed to humanity, to the Muslimin in general, and not just basically leave this world where nobody will know know us, right? Unless we do it, unless unless it's purely for the sake of worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for tawfiq, and we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to benefit us from these people and allow us to follow in their footsteps, and to provide the right environment in our homes as His Father had done, so that our children can, inshaAllah. Do something if we cannot. Our children can be given the right. If we have not been given the right environment, we feel our parents didn't, right? God bless them. But if they didn't, then at least we don't need to make the same mistake. If it's not the same mistake, we don't need to provide the same. We want to provide a better environment. Why not? So let's provide a better environment and our own parents should be happy with that. That my son or my daughter is providing a better environment than I was able to provide. Because at the end of the day, inshallah, the barakah is going to be in the family. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakti yadha al-jalali wal-ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Allahumma ya hannanu ya mannan la ilaha illa ant subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimeen. Oh Allah, we sit here today and ask for your mercy. Oh Allah, when we talk about the salihin, the ashara mubashara, We've been told that the mercy descends when your righteous people, your close ones, your awliya, when they have been mentioned, then your mercy descends. Oh Allah, we are in need of this mercy. Oh Allah, we're in need of this mercy. There are so many other things we could have been doing on this Friday, this Friday evening. Oh Allah, we ask that you are the one who gave us the tawfiq to be here in the first place. And oh Allah, we also ask that you that you grant us a good reward for this and you make this a source of blessing for us. You make this a source of closeness to you. You make this a source of blessing in our families. Oh Allah, you forgive our sins. Oh Allah, you purify us. Oh Allah, just like it was easier for them to follow the faith and to practice upon the faith and to express their obedience. Oh Allah, we find it difficult. Oh Allah, our world is different. But O oh Allah, we ask that you make it easy for us as well. O oh Allah, that you facilitate for us your love. Grant us your love and the love of those who love you. And O oh Allah, grant us the kalima on our deathbed. And O oh Allah, take us from this world in a better state than we are today. O oh Allah, make the rest of our li lives better than the past of our lives. And O oh Allah, make the best of our moments the moment where we stand in front of you on the day of judgment. O oh Allah, send abundant blessings on Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and grant us his company in the hereafter. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun al mursaleen. Alhamdulillah.